We're very excited to have you all with us this evening for our event in, on stewardship in your backyard. My name is Megan and I am one of the outreach and stewardship interns at the Queen's University Biological Station. And I'm here tonight with my coworker, Lindsay, um, who's also another outreach and stewardship intern, as well as Emily Verhoek, um, or sorry, Verhoek, the CUBE's outreach and teaching coordinator. And she'll be here this evening to help facilitate the event. So as mentioned, we will be recording this event and uploading it to our YouTube channel afterwards um, for those who couldn't be here tonight. And so we would love for you to keep your cameras on um, and interact with us if you're comfortable. But with that being said, you are more than okay to, to keep your camera off. Um, and we do ask that you would stay muted um, during the, the most of the presentation, just to make sure that everyone's audio is coming out clear. Um, but if you have any comments or questions throughout, then you're more than welcome to either type them in the chat or unmute yourself and, and ask out loud. Um, also, before we get started, I just wanted to take a minute and acknowledge the traditional territory that we are situated on. Um, I'm sure that all of us are joining from a bunch of different places, but Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. And specifically, the Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center is situated on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory and is a part of the Algonquin land claim by the Algonquins of Ontario, currently under negotiation with the federal government of Canada. Acknowledgement of these facts requires recognition of the pre-colonial history of this land and the peoples who lived here and continue to live here. The cultures and spiritualities of Indigenous peoples are connected to the land and the land is an integral part of their ways of knowing and living. These knowledge systems are continually evolving in relation to the land and its other inhabitants, both human and other than human. The Kingston Indigenous community continues to reflect the area's Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee roots. There is also a significant Métis community and there are First Peoples from other nations across Turtle Island present here today. So even though we can't host this event from Ebo Lake like we normally would, we still want to welcome you to Ebo Lake. The Ebo Lake Environmental Education Center is the public outreach arm of the Queen's University Biological Station, uh, which we often refer to as CUBES. Um, so CUBES is situated within the Frontenac Arch, as you can see on this little map here. And it's a part of Ontario where the ancient Precambrian shield rocks of the north extend down into the southern parts of Ontario and the United States, which connects towards the Adirondack Mountains over New York State. And so the importance of this land lies in the overlap of the north and the south, kind of like a funnel, uh, which gives rise to a great deal of biodiversity. So speaking of biodiversity, um, what is that? Um, in short, it is something that we want to keep in mind uh, when we think about our backyard. Um, but biodiversity is a term that we use to describe the enormous variety of life that we have on Earth and in its ecosystems. Um, so living things come in so many different shapes and sizes. Some of them we can see, like animals, including humans, uh, plants, and fungi, but others are very small, like bacteria, algae, and zooplankton. Um, and some of those you can't even see with the naked eye and you need a microscope. And so living things live all over the world in different habitats like desert, rainforests, coral reefs, and even the lakes and forests here in the Frontenac Arch. And so scientists estimate that there are about 8.7 million different species of plants and animals in existence, but only 1.2 million species have been identified and described so far. And so I have my first question for you all. Does anyone know which group of organisms is thought to have the greatest number of species? So an example might be, maybe there are the most different species of birds, or maybe you think it's flowering plants or vascular plants. Does anybody have any guesses? I think it's the microorganisms. <laughs> That's a good answer. Anybody else have a guess? You're also more than welcome to put answers in the chat box that should be at the bottom of your screen. Well, microorganisms is a good guess, but the answer is actually insects, um, which is interesting. Um, so there are about 90,000 species of insects that we know about, but scientists estimate that there are about 8 million. So it isn't confirmed, but um, it's estimated to be the greatest number of species. And the most actual described um, is the vascular plants as of now. And so why is this biodiversity important? Well, each species, no matter how big or how small it is, has an important role to play in maintaining the health of its ecosystem. And a healthy biodiversity provides a number of natural services for everyone, such as the protection of water resources, soil formation, nutrient storage and recycling, food, wood, medicines, recreation, tourism, cultural values, and the list goes on. However, biodiversity is declining, and this is a big concern. 
which is due to many factors like climate change, pollution, the illegal killing of animals and habitat destruction. And so we're here today to talk more about how you can help support the biodiverse biodiversity that is in your own backyard. And so just before we move on, would anyone be interested in just letting us know what species you've seen in your neighborhood or backyard or wherever you're um, joining this call from today? I can say that I've seen some chickadees in my backyard and it makes me very happy. Uh, I see uh, Phoebe, as the, I hear them all day, Phoebe, Phoebe, Phoebe. <laughs> I love it. All sorts of birds, of course, and then ground animals like chipmunks. And for us, the most exciting diverse bird is a hummingbird because they're kind of unusual or not uh, year-round habitats, uh, habitants there. So. And of course, snakes. Snakes are also seen on our property. Yeah, that's cool. We have lots of gypsy moth caterpillars in our backyard right now, right. which are not what uh -huh. I like to see, but there's lots of them. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing. And so if we want to protect the biodiversity that we have, uh, we can do so by being what's called an environmental steward. And so when we interact with the environment in order to protect and conserve ecosystems while improving sustainability, we can say that we are being environmental stewards. And by being an active environmental steward and actively working to protect and conserve native wildlife, you can help improve biodiversity right in your own backyard. So the question that you might be asking is, how do I get started? And so we've come up with three steps for anyone interested in improving their backyard biodiversity. And we also wanted to mention that myself and Megan are not researchers, but we instead are just two students with an interest in environmental stewardship and we're interested in sharing our learning with you. Uh, so the first thing that I would do is take a look outside. What do you see in your yard? What species do you want to attract to your yard? How much of your property do you have to work with? Do you have a small apartment balcony or do you have a huge farm? Um, Regardless of how much space you have, there are still different options that you can take to improve biodiversity. And so when I look at my backyard, I see a lot of green grass, um, which is really nice to look at, and it's easier to take care of than a giant garden. Um, however, I'm also trying to be conscious about what goes on that grass, because um, I don't want anything to harm the wildlife or leach into water. Um, like I said before, I also see some chickadees, and so I'm trying to think about what I could do for them. Um, I also see some dandelions in my yard and I'm going to try and keep them uh, just in case the bees need them. However, I will admit that I'm not in charge of cutting my grass and I think they got run over with the lawnmower this morning. <laughs> um, and I also have a garden uh, that I want to try and fill with some native plants. And so step number two is now that you've taken a look outside, think about what you see. So my large patch of grass, what potential does that have? Uh, maybe I could put a bird habitat on it. Um, to support the chickadees that I can see, or maybe I want to put a bird bath. Um, and in my garden, I can also try and provide a pollinator friendly habitat by putting in some flowers that might bloom at different times throughout the year. And finally, make a plan. And so what are your goals? Sometimes sketching it out can help um, visualize what space you have and where you might want to add things. Um, and so I think my goal would be to just be able to see more wildlife in my yard and to use some of the empty space, not necessarily fill it all. Um, but I think I have too much empty space. And so this is actually a photo of my backyard here um, in Canada. And I think it's really pretty, but if, if you look closely, you can see there's really only a small amount of garden space between the patio and the grass. Um, and so how can I help improve the biodiversity in my yard? It's not necessarily a bad backyard, um, but I think it has potential. And so if anyone has any suggestions off the top of your head, I would love to hear them. Um, but if not, it's also a chance to think about what does your yard look like and what areas do you want to improve? So I'm not sure if anybody else knows what they might put on my... I, I would put a vegetable garden in that yard because you seem to have a lot of sun there and mm -hmm. it would do really well. Um, and uh, we're, uh, I'm in the Rideau Lakes Horticultural Society and we're doing an experiment right now to see if we could have a vegetable garden that you just put in in the spring and you don't water and you don't weed and you don't need to do any work in it 
and harvest it in the fall. So <laughs> it is possible to have a vegetable garden without, you know, a lot of work involved. That sounds also like my kind of garden. <laughs> And, and that way you'd have less lawn and and the the uh, garden plants you know that safe beans for instance they flower so they're contributing to uh, food for pollinators and uh, if you let some of them go to seed that could help the chickadees too <laughs> that's awesome I like that. I put a single tomato in my garden, but I wouldn't call it a vegetable garden yet. <laughs> All right, well, we can come back to that. I like that suggestion. Yeah, thanks so much for, for sharing your own ideas and hopefully that time was helpful too to kind of consider how you can um, be thinking about your backyard in, in different ways. We have kind of some tips on the screen now. Um, but again, to acknowledge that these are not a complete list. There's definitely a lot more that you can do, um, but these are just some of the things that we're going to elaborate on um, later tonight and throughout the presentation. Um, and again, we will have kind of some time to dig into these a little bit more and some time at the end also to discuss some other ideas. Um, but starting off, I think probably a big help would be planting native plants. So whether that be flowers or a vegetable garden, as, as you mentioned, um, native plants are anything that grows naturally in your local area. Um, and you can also consider them in terms of the different pollinators and maybe other species that depend on those plants. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these species are disappearing. And so when you're able to plant native plants, then you're providing habitat and food and shelter for them um, to encourage biodiversity in your land. Um, also, native plants and native pollinators have a longer evolutionary history and are better adapted to each other. So um, although there's there's some studies that, that have inconclusive evidence, um, most scientists, or I, again, that's a little bit of a generalization, but most people would say that um, you're able, in planting native plants that you're actually able to improve um, the populations of native pollinators. Also in planting native, you're lessening the risk of invasion, um, which again, we'll touch on later. Um, and it's also important to consider plants that are native to your region and not necessarily to your province or state. Um, I know that when we were planting a pollinator garden at Elbow Lake, we were wanting to, I don't remember the species, but we were wanting to put in a certain species and then realized that that species was actually native to Northern Ontario and not to Kingston. And so in introducing it to the garden, there was the potential for it to become invasive. And so we decided against that. Um, it's also important to consider the habitat requirements of your backyard or of your space. And just because a plant is native doesn't mean it will necessarily do well. Um, plants have different habitat requirements and preferences, just like you and me and a bunch of other different species. Um, so in terms of how much sun and how much water they need, um, as well as kind of yeah, how often it's sunny, what their soil type is like, all those kinds of things. And so when you're considering what plants to potentially put into your garden or to put into your yard, you're going to want to think about your backyard and how much sun it gets. If it's direct or indirect sunlight, how much does it rain? How much are you able to water it? What is what is the soil type? And then consider planting plants that fit the conditions of your backyard um, to ensure they're successful. Um, if you're curious about finding native plants in Ontario and in Canada, there's two websites on the slide there that you can kind of just make note of or, or take a screenshot of. Um, the first one is the Ontario Tree Atlas. And so this will bring you to a map that has um, all the different regions of Ontario. And you can kind of zoom into the region in which you're in. and It'll give you a list of all the different tree and shrub species that are native to that area. Um, and then the second link is Canada Plant. And it's a very similar website um, that gives different native plants across Canada, but it, it goes beyond trees and also talks about flowering plants, ferns, and grasses, um, and it's, it's organized by province. And so those are just to give you some ideas of what native plants might be available to your region. There's also a lot of um, nurseries and greenhouses in Ontario and specifically in the Kingston region, um, such as the Lemoyne Point Nursery, Sun Harvest Greenhouses, Birds Greenhouses, or Ferguson's Greenhouses that provide um, native plants. Um, the ones that I just mentioned, they were not affiliated with them in any way. They're not sponsored, but those were just some of the ones that we reached out to when we made our pollinator garden at Elbow Lake. Um, also, another thing to potentially consider is avoiding big box stores, as often those stores will use harmful pesticides. And, and these pesticides can be dangerous to native species or pollinators. Um, and so when you're like sourcing plants from smaller nurseries or greenhouses, you are able to kind of minimize the amount of pesticides that you're using in your garden without even knowing. <laughs> 
All right, so another tip that we have um, to improve your backyard biodiversity is to remove the second largest threat to biodiversity, which is invasive species. Does anybody know what the largest threat to biodiversity is? No, that's okay. The <laughs> largest threat to biodiversity is habitat destruction. Um, and so what is an invasive species? Well, invasive species is any kind of living organism. So it can be an amphibian, maybe like the cane toad, um, a plant, insect, fish, fungus, bacteria, or even just an organism, seeds or eggs, that is not native to an ecosystem and causes harm. So invasive species are those that have been moved from their original habitat into a new one. And now they're so good at living there that they make it difficult for native species that have been there all along. And in terms of invasive plants, Learning to identify them and being able to remove them can try to help native plants that are trying to live in their own habitats. And there is a huge list of invasive species, um, but we're just going to mention our top five invasive plants that you might find in a garden or urban environment. And for, well, I was going to say, um, I like the graphic on that slide. It's funny if you got a chance to read it. <laughs> So here are five invasive species um, that you might find in your yard, but this is not a full list. And so the first one that we have on the left here is garlic mustard. And so garlic mustard spreads very fast and it's actually considered one of Ontario's most damaging forest plant species. It was brought to Ontario from Europe because of its richness in vitamins A and C. However, it's a really big problem because garlic mustard actually puts harmful chemicals into the soil that make it impossible for any other plant to live there. And so it does this by having its roots release chemicals that interfere with the vital fungi growth, which is needed for native plants to uptake nutrients. And the next one that we have um, at the bottom there, the little purple flower is periwinkle, which looks really pretty, but it actually has invasive tendencies. And so it was introduced as an ornamental flower. And you can also purchase periwinkle at um, some plant nurseries. So it's important to be able to identify it and hopefully not bring it into your garden um, because periwinkle easily spreads over large areas and it thrives in shade or sun. Um, but it also can choke out the native ground cover, including native plants like Ontario's trillium. And also its leaves and seeds are toxic to grazers and birds, which decreases the biodiversity that we're trying to bring into our yard. And the third one in the top middle there is European buckthorn. Uh, and so that is a small shrub or tree that is native to Eurasia and it thrives in various habitats and it also forms dense thickets. And so why this is a problem is it alters nitrogen levels in the soil to create better conditions for its own growth while discouraging the growth of native species, which is not good. And buckthorn also acts as an overwintering host for the soybean aphid, which is an insect that damages soybean crops. And finally, buckthorn produces an abundance of berries, which make birds and other animals sick, um, which provides little nutrition to the animals, but spreads the seeds. So the plant is happy, but the animals are not. And the fourth one that we have on the bottom here with the orange flowers is daylily. Uh, which is a popular garden plant because of its hardiness, ability to spread, and the showy blooms. So um, some people will think that that is amazing and they want to put that in their garden. You may have seen daylilies along roadsides um, and near old buildings um, and near homes where plants have escaped from gardens into the surrounding ecosystem. But once daylilies are established, they are capable of displacing native vegetation communities and also altering the ecosystems where it invades. And it also doesn't have the same relationship with native pollinators like other native plants do. And finally, we have Lily of the Valley on the top right there. Um, it is a very innocent looking plant, but beware, it also has invasive behaviors um, that overtake native plants. And so you might think there's a little bit of a theme going on here. And once Lily of the Valley is planted, it will spread rapidly. And so even though you want it to stay in your garden, it will not. Um, and so some people think this is a good thing, um, by planting it in their garden where nothing else will grow. Um, but just beware, it is invasive. And so what do you do with these invasive species? Um, these plants can be pulled out of gardens, um, but aim to get all of the roots to prevent them from returning. And when you remove an invasive species, it's important to dispose of them properly in order to prevent them from coming back. And one way to do this is if the city that you live in has a compost program, um, you can put the invasive plants in 
um, the citywide compost bins due to the high heat that this material gets put under, um, but not in your backyard composter as it's not the same. Um, and so if your city doesn't have a citywide composting program, the plants will need to go in the garbage. And we have a website that you can reference. It's called Grow Me Instead. Um, the link will be at the end of the presentation, um, but it's from the Ontario Invasive Plant Council. And so it tells you um, if you've removed invasive species from your garden, um, what is a good native species to put there instead? Oh, I think the link just went in the chat. Thanks, Megan. No worries. Um, then moving on to our next point, another way to improve the biodiversity of your yard is to create a wildlife and pollinator garden. Um, so this has kind of already been mentioned before in terms of in planting native plants, um, but you can kind of take it one step for, for further, sorry about that, um, by planting flowers of different kinds and um, sizes and shapes and colors and whatnot to attract native pollinators, as well as to provide habitat and shelter um, for other species such as insects or frogs. Um, but if we're going to take a step back and just kind of talk about pollination to begin with, um, pollination um, allows species of flowering plants to reproduce. And so each flower has nectar and pollen in it. Um, and pollinators will visit the flower um, in, in search of the nectar as it provides a sugar source for them. Um, and pollen will, will stick to them and they'll, as they transport from flower to flower, the, um, the flower species is able to transfer their pollen and allows them to reproduce. Um, so I have a little bit of a demonstration here just to kind of ease the, your understanding, hopefully. So I'll just stop sharing. Um, I don't know if you can see, but I have a bunch of different flowers on my little cutting board here. And each of these flowers contains a spice or a, a powder of some sort um, to kind of imitate what pollen would look like. And I also have these cotton balls, um, which represent our pollinator. So that can be either like a bee or a fly or even a bird. And as your pollinator visits from flower to flower and lands there in search of the nectar, you can see that it starts to collect some of the pollen. And as it goes from species to species, we see kind of more pollen being added to it. Um, Cross pollination can also occur where um, different flowers of like not like not the same root flower, um, pollen spreads from each one. And so as it goes for, from, from flower to flower, we can see that the pollen is sticking to um, the bee species or the pollinator species um, to allow the, the flower to, to, to produce more flowers. And so this is a really exciting relationship. It was really cool that um, evolution kind of made it this way as the pollinator is able to get a food source through the nectar and the flower species are able to reproduce. Fortunately, though, a lot of our native pollinator species are in decline. So our native pollinators are animals like bees, flies, beetles, butterflies, moths, and birds, um, and hummingbirds. And often when you think of a pollinator, maybe you think of a honeybee, but honeybees actually aren't native to the region. And in fact, their popularity has decreased some of our native bee species like the mason bee or leaf cutting bees. Um, more and more pesticides are being used and misused in agriculture and gardening. And these pesticides contain chemicals called neonicotinoids, um, otherwise called neonics. And neonics were first introduced because they were um, a safer alternative as they're less toxic to larger animals such as mammals. Um, but neonics last longer in the environment and their residues will accumulate on pollen and nectar, which exposes pollinators and other um, species and threatens their populations. Um, also, many key food sources and critical, critical habitats for pollinators are being lost because of urbanization, which is especially different um, difficult for migratory pollinators. And so because pollinator species are declining, it's important to plant habitat for them, and including some flowering plants in your garden can really be a huge help. Um, although this is not a major cause of pollinator species um, death, it is important to understand the difference between bees, wasps, and flies, as many people will kill beneficial insects um, out of fear or out of panic. Um, but if in yeah, minimizing the populations of these bee species, you are um, unfortunately damaging um, pollinator populations. And so I've got some questions here, a little bit of a guide to help you figure out what species it is and whether or not it's a pollinator. So I know there's a lot of text on the screen. You're welcome to, to screenshot it or take a picture of it if you'd like to refer to this later. Um, but just a few kind of key points to note is that bees themselves are pollinators and wasps and flies also um, do help pollinate as they do travel from flower to flower. But wasps are actually carnivores. And so they're not as interested in um, 
having nectar as their primary food source. And instead, if they're on flowers, they're likely searching for aphids or other insects to be their food. Um, whereas it's bees themselves that are likely gonna be on the flower and will be carrying pollen. In fact, many bees have sorry, and, and different organs that they use to carry the pollen, whether that be different hairs on, the, on their stomach or on their legs, um, or even some bees will actually ingest the pollen and regurgitate it to, or sorry, um, ingest the nectar and regurgitate it later on. Um, another thing to note is whether or not the species has hair, and so bees are often considered hairy, where they've got hair all over their body, um, whereas wasps are more smooth with some bristles. Um, but a key thing to note is that bees, all bees have branched hairs. So although this is a little bit difficult to tell them apart as it often needs to be done by researchers under microscopes, every single species of bee will have branched hairs on them. And then a few other kind of characteristics, um, bees and wasps have elbowed antenna, whereas flies don't. Um, flies also have much larger bulging eyes that make up the majority of their face, whereas bees and wasps have smaller oval shaped eyes that are more towards the side of their body. Um, flies also only have two wings, whereas bees and wasps have four wings um, with two pairs kind of attached together. Um, and then kind of the key thing that I really think of when I'm trying to identify bees and wasps is when they're flying, um, if their legs are hanging or if they're tucked in. And so bees, when they fly, their legs actually hang and, and to help them kind of collect pollen as they're going about, whereas wasps have their legs tucked in towards them. And so if you can see a, a species flying, you're not sure what it is. If you see their legs out, then it's likely a bee. Great. So now that we've gone through that, I know I threw a lot of information at you. We're going to give you a little bit of a pop quiz. So I've got two pictures here that could either be a bee, a wasp, or a fly. Um, and Lindsay will launch a poll shortly to see how well you do at identifying them. So here's our first image. All right, I think everybody has voted. Um, I can share this. Awesome. Um, well, unfortunately, you guys were a little bit tricked. This is actually a hoverfly. And so these are flies that are quite common um, to mimic or to imitate bees, um, likely as an anti-predator behavior. And so if they look like bees, then other species aren't going to want to eat them because they're scared of their sting. Um, but a few things to note is that this species, although it has hair, it only has two pairs of, or sorry, it only has two wings. Um, and their eyes are quite big and take up the majority of their face. So that was kind of what gave it away there. All right, and I'll move on to your second question. There we go. Is this a bee, a wasp, or a fly? All right. Awesome. Nice job, everyone. Um, so this actually is a bee. It's a type of leaf cutter bee species. Um, and although it's kind of hard to see the wings in this photo to not give it away, you can see that the bee body is long and flat and quite furry. Um, it's got a round ad abdomen, but still with a defined waist um, and oval shaped eyes that don't take up the majority of their face. But then the key factor here is that the bee is flying and you can see its legs. So great job on that one. Now, now moving forward to thinking a little bit more about how to create a wildlife and pollinator garden. Um, before starting, there's four questions that the um, government of Ontario wants you to consider. So the first one is whether or not you and your neighbors actually want more wildlife that may be encouraged by the activities you have in mind. So in creating a wildlife garden, you have to be expecting that wildlife will show up in your garden, hopefully. Um, you also want to think about if any of your ideas lead to increased pressure from predators on neighboring livestock farms or potential damages to adjacent agricultural crops. Again, it's important to be respectful of your neighbors, especially your farming neighbors, if you live in that kind of area. The third question is my personal favorite, and it's are you willing to accept those unanticipated visitors that may show up in addition to or instead of the ones you had in mind? Um, I think this question is, is quite funny because often you want to create a garden and you want to be able to have many different pollinator species or maybe the pretty butterflies that will come and visit. Um, but actually in creating biodiversity, you want as many species there as you can. Um, I know when we were creating the pollinator garden at Elbow Lake, which is shown in the photo here, um, we had some species that were feeding on the milkweed plants. And I remember myself and Lindsay were quite disappointed because we were like, oh no, the milkweed plants, like, are they gonna survive? And we had um, Deb Stanama, who's an elder, um, an indigenous elder remind us that, that our other plants, or sorry, other animals need food too. And so in having these milkweed plants, even though it was quite sad to see them being eaten, they actually were providing a food source to another um, animal in, 
um, in that in that habitat. And so be, be cognizant that maybe your garden will invite some um, species that you may not necessarily want, but it actually is a good thing, assuming that they're not invasive and not causing harm to the area. And then the final question to consider is, does your municipality allow the habitat improvement ideas that you may have in mind? So just being aware of the different bylaws and permits that, that may be necessary in creating your garden or in creating, um, yeah, any changes that you want to make in your backyard. Now, if we're considering some tips and tricks, first and foremost, you want to be using native plants, again, because of their evolutionary relationship with pollinators and the fact that they're able to prevent invasion. You also want to use a variety of plants. So that could look like plants of different shapes, colors, scents, and bloom times to encourage multiple species of pollinators and improve biodiversity. Um, I also think it's quite interesting, but different pollinator species actually have different preferences of flowers. And so hummingbirds have been found to favor red flowers with a trumpet shape, whereas bees prefer shallow tubular shapes with single, single blooms. Um, and bees and butterflies like purple, white, yellow, and blue flowers with fragrance. Um, so just like we have different preferences on what food we're eating, these pollinator species do too. And so the more variety you have, the more species you may end up finding. You also want to consider shelter and water. We'll touch on this in a little bit on, but you can maybe use keep parts of your garden tidy. So not mowing right away when, when spring comes around or having kind of a corner where there's a log pile to encourage um, insects that are nesting there to have um, space. Also, if there's any nest or habitat already on your property, um, make sure that those are able to stay there again if they're not providing any harm. And then also consider if there's places for water and if the species are able to access the water. So you might want to add maybe some stepping stones so that insects and butterflies don't drown while they're drinking. And then finally, avoid pesticides. So minimize harmful chemicals in the environment to protect pollinators um, as this is one of the major reasons for their decline. We are going to share some links later in the presentation um, that kind of summarize these different tips and provide some other tips for creating a wildlife and pollinator garden. But moving on to habitat, um, again, wildlife need habitat, and that is one of the major causes for biodiversity declines. Um, and to consider what makes a good habitat, you'll want to think about food, water, shelter, space, as well as nesting habitat. And you want to consider each of these different things when you're creating habitat or planning out your backyard. So for instance, when thinking about water, I kind of alluded to this earlier, butterflies need stepping stones in the water so that while they're drinking, they can rest and they won't drown. So you can see a photo here with some stones. I believe the butterflies are fake, but it kind of gives an example of, of how they can be drinking without um, worrying about drowning. Um, you also want to make sure that your water is cleaned or replaced regularly to prevent mosquito brooding, um, breeding. Sorry, um, mosquitoes are great and there are really important species, but I'm sure your neighbors wouldn't be too happy if you start creating a nesting ground for a lot of different mosquitoes. So yeah, as I mentioned, you want to think about what, what it is that you actually want to attract and plan your backyard around that. So thinking of trees and shrubs that you want to add, maybe flowering plants or fruiting plants. Um, these different choices will depend on what wildlife you want to attract. So again, um, different pollinator species like different, um, different plants and other species also like different foods. So butterflies often like Joe pieweed, whereas wintering birds prefer mountain ash berries. So you'll want to kind of think of the different species and think of your backyard to see what makes the most sense. Um, considering habitat, you want to, trees and shrubs provide habitat as well. And if you're able to minimize how much raking you do in the fall, it actually provides habitats for insects and can create a butterfly nursery for those that are, um, yeah, reproducing. You also want to consider rewilding. Um, so often the best thing that you can do to invite biodiversity is to kind of let nature be. Um, this is quite intimidating and we do not mean that you have to completely let everything be overgrown in your backyard, um, but maybe consider depending on how much space you have, if there's a corner of your yard that um, you can have a brush pile or a log pile um, for and or leave fallen branches and leaves um, for overwintering species. Um, I know the Nature Conservancy of Canada also had an initiative called No Mow May that encouraged people to just not mow their backyards during the month of May, which allows dandelions and maybe some other longer grasses or other plants um, that, that flower early to, to survive so that early migrators or early pollinator migrators to Canada have flowers that they actually um, can use. There's also different ways that you can create physical habitats, so whether that be insect hotels or mason bee habitats, as shown on the screen, um, as well as different bat houses or um, butterfly watering holes. Um, our Elbow Lake website has some ideas and instructions on how to make those, but you can also just do a quick Google search if you want to create habitat yourself.
Another thing to consider is water conservation. Um, so as, as hopefully many of us know, freshwater is one of the most essential natural resources and it only accounts for 3% of surface water. Um, and then beyond that, usable water is even more scarce because that 3% also makes up water with pollution, um, water that's in the form of ice or snow or even groundwater that is difficult to access. And so we need to be really conscious of the water that we have and even using small differences in the way we use water in our individual backyards can make a difference. And so some different ways to implement water conservation is by collecting it with a rain barrel. Um, again, unfortunately, this isn't possible for everyone, but if it is possible for you, it might be a really good tip to use. You can also think about when you're watering plants, watering the soil and not the leaves to, to minimize evaporation. Um, you also can consider plants with low water use, which goes back to considering what plants you have um, and what habitat requirements you have in your backyard so that you can minimize um, water use in that way. Also by using mulch, um, you're able to keep water in the soil and keep it moist so you don't have to water as often. And if you water in the early morning or evening, again, there's less water that's lost to evaporation. Another thing to consider is compost. So compost is decomposing organic matter and it's often done with the help of decomposers such as fungi, bacteria, or worms. Um, these species require high nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, and moisture. And so if you're creating a compost pile, you'll wanna consider each of those four things. Um, there's a bunch of different materials that can be composted and depending on your region, um, if you want to compost in the city, they may have different requirements, um, but kind of overall you can consider leaves, grass, vegetable and food scraps, coffee grounds, oily cardboard and paper scraps. You also are able to um, compost meat, but just be aware as it often does attract animals. And then just an example, in Kingston, compost will only be picked up if it contains some form of food waste. Um, so be aware of kind of the different bylaws and policies that are in your regional neighborhood. Um, also, you can keep compost yourself for gardening. You can either do cold composting, which where you pile compost in the ground or in a bin, and it doesn't require maintenance, but it does take longer to decompose. Or you can do hot composting, um, which is where con the composting season coincides with the growing season and you have to do a little bit more work, but you'll want to add layers of high carbon material and high nitrogen material um, and then make sure that the, the pile has access to oxygen so that's aerated, there's holes in it, and you can water it periodically and move materials around in, sure, in order to improve the decomposition. And then when you have compost, you can use it for your garden or potted plants um, to just improve some nutrients in the soil and improve the soil structure. And it can also be used as mulch material. And finally, um, participating in citizen science can be a really fun and exciting, but also helpful way to improve biodiversity. So citizen science is using your own observations of species that you see in your backyard or neighborhood um, and using that to provide data to researchers doing studies all over the world. So one tool that you can use, again, this is not the only tool, this is just one that we use often, is called iNaturalist. And so iNaturalist, um, how it works is you can make an account, you go outside, you write down any species that you observe, the name, any photos or media, videos, sounds of it that you hear, um, the location and date that you saw that species, and then any other additional notes. Um, and you can kind of log all that into that observation and it'll be vetted by um, identifiers and scientists all over the world. If you're not sure what the species identification is, that's okay. You can add some, add some suggestions. Um, and there's people on the app or on the website constantly that can also be providing suggestions of what the species identity is. Um, and then you can also use iNaturalist just to explore. So I will stop sharing and then share the actual website because it is quite fun. Um, so this is what it looks like. It's just iNaturalist.org and this um, section of the website kind of flips, but you can go to explore in the top corner and this lets you see all the different observations that have been taking place all over the world. And so you can kind of just zoom in as you wish. Again, you can see there's a lot there or you can search by species or by location. So if I wanted to see what has been observed at Cubes, then I can go to a Pinnacan Road, which is where it's on and see that there's been um, a few species that have been studied there, but then if I were to kind of clear my search, then I would be able to see a lot more species. And so this website is, is really easy to use and it's also really cool to know that any observations that you see can co contribute to, to long term monitoring or conservation projects. Awesome. So this list that we have talked about today um, is just a brainstorm of possibilities and there are also many other options out there. Uh, so this is what I think the highest potential 
of my backyard might be. Um, it is not going to look like this this summer, um, but this is just my brainstorming ideas. And we want to emphasize that there's no such thing as the perfect backyard. And so just doing the best you can with your space um, and starting with the small steps um, is perfectly fine. And if there are any children in the audience, just make sure you check in with your parents before you start altering um, the yard. They might not like that. Um, so in my yard, maybe I'm just gonna start with um, maybe a little vegetable garden like we talked about earlier. Um, I would like to do a birdhouse, um, but we'll see. Um, and maybe put some flowering plants. So maybe just pick a couple things to start with and go from there. And it also doesn't all have to be accomplished right at once. It can kind of be um, a long-term goal that you might have. And so those are some of my backyard stewardship goals, but now we would just like to open it up if anyone would like to share what their backyard uh, stewardship goals are. Or if you have any questions that you wanna ask about. Um, if you want to share your ideas, you can either um, unmute yourself and share them orally. You can type them into the chat, but then also on Zoom, there's an annotate feature. So it should show up either under the three dots. If you could click on those and then click annotate or just in the bottom bar of your Zoom account. Um, and then if you do so, there's a way to add drawings or add text and you can share your goals with us to kind of help keep you accountable or to brainstorm a little bit about what your backyard could look like. Uh, I identified uh, a few of the invasive plants that are in my garden, the lily of the valley, and another one that Emily confirmed is a is a, an invasive is a gout weed, which I already know how invasive it is. <laughs> so she's given me a a link to how to remove it. So that will be that will be my project this summer. I think. Thank you. I know it's challenging, but it's worth it. I removed a lot of buckthorn and a lot of periwinkle from my backyard for the last couple of years, and now it's finally gone. So it, it is possible. <laughs> I, I have lily of the valley too. So I did have a lot as well. It's gone now though, I finally. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone else have any goals for their backyard? I'd like to continue to encourage hummingbirds to visit. We've enjoyed that for many years uh, at, at the lake, obviously, and also here in Arizona. I'd also like to encourage bats uh, on our property for many reasons. I think they're interesting and they're also quite healthy for the different kinds of uh, flying insects that we see in our, in our neck of the woods. Yeah, making a bat box is really effective too. Yes. Um, we have a bat box on one of the the uh, buildings at Elbow. And I never see any bats going in, but I always see lots of poop on the ground. So I know they're using it, which is great. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. So it's exciting when you know that what you put in place is, is working and being used. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing everyone. It's, it's fun to be able to see those on there. And then hopefully this presentation was helpful. Um, if anyone has questions, you're more than welcome to ask, um, or we can kind of discuss a little bit. But again, just a little disclaimer, Lindsay and myself are only students. And so we're not experts by any means, but are just really passionate about this. And so we'd love to share the little expertise that we do have. I wanted to add something about the iNaturalist app. So I use it often. Um, but one thing I would say is if you find a species at risk in particular, um, I, you can choose if it shows the exact location of where you found it or if it obscures where you found it. And I suggest that you do that. Um, so place it there. The people, the researchers that need that information will still be able to get the actual location, but people just going and looking at the app won't be able to see the actual location of where those species are found, which will help uh, reduce the risk of, of poaching and collecting for pet trade because that that happens a lot, especially with reptiles and, and amphibians. Um, so that's my only suggestion. But I, I encourage you to anytime you move a Blanding's turtle off the road or see a gray rat snake, uh, log those because it's important information that researchers need to know of where they are located. So it is good work. <laughs> 
All right, well, if anyone has anything else they want to talk about, we can still do that. But in the meantime, we just wanted to draw your attention to some of the take home resources that we have. Um, so these are located on the elbowlakecenter.ca website. Um, and the remainder of it is on the slide there. Um, and so we have many online activities on our website. And so some of them are on biodiversity. Uh, we have one on pollinator garden tips. Uh, we have some instructions on how to build a bee hotel, uh, a bird feeder. Uh, we have a species at risk worksheet. And we also have um, an invasive species wanted poster activity um, that you can print off and have some fun doing. And we also wanted to let you know that we do have a YouTube channel and it's called the Official Cubes YouTube channel. Um, and so if you want to rewatch um, this presentation tonight, it will be up there shortly. But the recordings of our past events are also located here. And so the arrow is pointing to the playlist called Public Outreach Talks. And so um, if you liked this event, there are also some past events on there. And so we have some that featured invasive species with Megan Quinn from NCC. Uh, we also had one on an introduction to our native pollinators with Dr. Jessica Forrest. And we also had one on species at risk in Canada with Dr. James Page. Uh, so if any of those pique your interest, um, feel free to check out the official Cubes YouTube channel. And like I promised, there are also some more links um, on invasive species if you're interested, um, such as the Grow Me Instead Ontario website. And there are also some um, Ontario and government sites up there as well. Our webinar link is on there, but it is also on the YouTube channel. And that's everything. So thank you everyone for taking the time out of your day to come and chat with us about um, backyard biodiversity. And we will be having events like this throughout the summer as well. And so these are some of the topics that we'll be talking about throughout the summer. Uh, we haven't confirmed the dates yet, but if you stay tuned to um, our websites there and our social media, we will be posting updates on that. Awesome. Well, that is everything we had planned. Thank you again so, so much for, for joining us tonight. Um, and please, we would recommend that you check out our YouTube channel or any of the, the websites and social media for some more activities. Um, and we can stick around for a little bit if anyone has questions or want to chat more, but that's the official end. And thank you again so much for, for joining us tonight.